This week on the Backtable Podcast. So, you know, whether you do this robotically, whether you do this open or single port, you know, in some places, I think, I think you have to obviously be very respectful of your boundaries of dissection. Like anything we do surgically, your best chance of cure is the first time around. If you feel you do the surgery better open or you feel more comfortable open, offer them open surgery to do the groins. Or same thing for robotics. I think I think you have to adhere. You have to make sure, like you said, you're following the templates. You're getting all those nodes, including the ones in the supermedial component. I think when I do the operation, I think very meticulous in, in handling of the tissues. Preoperatively, we always make sure we optimize those patients. Make sure if they're malnourished, or if there's any you know diabetes or poorly controlled sugars, we optimize those before surgery. Standard, obviously, antibiotics, etc. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. Hey, everyone, really exciting news. Our listeners asked, and we have answered. We now have CME available. You can get AMA Category 1 CME for listening to Backtable and then filling out a reflection. You can find the CME links on the episode pages at backtable.com or you can also find the CME links in the show notes. It's a small cost for the credit, much less than you would spend at a conference, and it helps support the show. Powered by CMEFI. Using AI technology to bring the right education to the right place at the right time. You can do this in just a few minutes. If you're already listening to Backtable, might as well get a CME credit for it. Again, this helps support the show and allows us to keep bringing you great content. Now, on with the episode. This is Aditya Bagrodi as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Phil Spies from Moffitt Cancer Center down in Tampa. Welcome, Phil. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for the invite, and it's great to be here. No, it's a, it's really a, an honor. Looking forward to this one. I think, um, A, when it comes to penile cancer, there's just a few people in the world that have really produced so much uh, information for the care and management research for patients with penile cancer. And obviously, it's, it's a topic that is many times, I think, hard for urologists, trainees to kind of wrap their brain around since it is such a rare disease. So I would think we could just kind of run through the whole penile cancer journey and, you know, really pick your brain on the tips and tricks that you give your residents and fellows and students. Does that sound all right? Sounds great. All right. Fantastic. So let's just jump on into it. You know, when you're taking your intake on a new patient that you're suspicious of penile cancer, what are the kind of critical things of the history and physical that you really dial in on? So I think those are really critical things. And I think like everything in medicine, taking a really good history, understanding what the, the nature of what, how long a lesion has been specifically there, how has it changed? Is it painful, painless? Is it grown in size? Is it affecting urinary stream? Has there been any associated symptoms in terms of other masses, including lymph nodes that have been palpable? And those types of things critical to understanding a little bit about the natural history of it. And then obviously understanding what are the risk factors for potential penile cancer. And as we all know, sexual transmitted diseases, particularly HPV related, has been a really a, a critical consideration in terms of risk factors for many penile cancers that we see. Probably close to 60% of them are associated to that. You know, we definitely want to sort of make sure we educate patients as well as part of this, making sure that if they do have risk factors, taking precautionary step. If they are sexually active, particularly if they're doing a lot of high risk sexual activity, multiple partners unprotected, that they do understand the risks and, and take precautions associated with that. And then obviously a good physical examination, you know, I think the classic of what we're taught as medical students really applies here because there's a lot of things on the, on the history and physical examination will tell you a little bit about where you sort of stand in terms of understanding what ultimately is the risk this patient may have penile cancer and also what potentially the uh, stage and potentially a pattern of disease this patient may have. No, that's great, Phil. You know, wholeheartedly agree with that. And, you know, certainly something that we see on the academic side is oftentimes patients have gone through a whole bout of various creams, salves, ointments, and so forth. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Is that okay for a primary care physician or a dermatologist to try several weeks of, you know, steroid cream, antifungals before they come in to see you? 
I'm glad you asked that, Diddy. I think that's a really critical consideration is I, I sometimes I'm always a marvel and amazed sometimes patients have been trying creams or potentially in denial that something is concerning when it's grown to over five or seven centimeters and is bleeding and it has foul smelling associated with it. So I would say any lesion on the penis, uh, which is particular there and is concerned should be looked at by a primary care physician. And I tell this to primary care physicians as well is that if it's concerning to you, it's concerning to us. And so definitely, 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 I think it's important that people get evaluated early on. And really, ultimately, if there's concerns, getting a biopsy, which is really the gold standard to understand, is this truly a cancer or is this potentially something which is non-cancerous? And I would say low threshold for biopsy, but particularly early referral from the primary care physicians to urologists so they can be appropriately evaluated and managed in, in a timely fashion. Yeah, I totally agree. It, it is remarkable. And sometimes I feel like you, you get both ends of the spectrum. You either get you know, something that's just mildly erythematous, a little bit raised, not overly concerning, or you're going to get your, like you said, fungating, ulcerated, infected mass that's been treated with antibiotics and creams. So maybe let's start out with that, you know, slightly less dramatic presentation. Let's just talk about, you know, getting the weeds of the biopsy. Are these typically things you're doing in the clinic? You go to the OR, are they diagnostic, therapeutic? Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I think a lot of clinicians do it a little bit differently. I often personally like to do these biopsies in a procedure room under some form of analgesia, you know, whether that be EMLA creams or that be, you know, doing intralesional type lidocaine or, or truthfully in some patients, twilight type sedation. I think doing them with any form of sedation should ultimately not be done. I've had a few residents ask about doing that. In some clinicians, I know they do it as part of their clinical clinics and those types of things. I personally like to do them on days I'm in the OR doing minor cases and I do them in procedure rooms with just a little touch of local or it's just a much better experience. And I would tell you truthfully, the quality of the biopsy that you get is probably higher. What I've really adopted in the last couple of years is getting a punch biopsy, like a two millimeter punch or three millimeter punch and just putting literally one suture and putting a little bit of local in that area, obviously without lidocaine. And it really gives me a really good quality biopsy. I'll, I have an understanding of underlying tissue in terms of what we're dealing with. And oftentimes it'll drive uh, better ultimately what type of treatment I, I will need to do, particularly if it is cancer. So essentially getting punch biopsies, which are a type of incisional biopsies, establish a diagnosis, and that's really going to kind of dictate next steps. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, when you've got your large fungating mass, this is, you know, clearly penile cancer. Are you even messing around with a biopsy or is that straight a trip to the OR, partial penectomy, kind of get on with it? Yeah, pretty much. You know, traditionally people said, you know, you get, get to get a, a biopsy for tissue diagnosis. But I would tell you, as you know, is these tumors have a very characteristic appearance, highly keratinizing, typically very friable. Tell people, unfortunately, they have a very distinctive smell like head and neck squamous cell carcinomas that are, you can't really mistake them for anything else. So I would take them straight to the OR. Yes, I get a biopsy before I do the resection itself, but you can get that on frozen sections for confirmatory purposes. And I think that getting them expedited in terms of management is probably the most critical consideration there. And do you try to have your GU pathologist on standby for these cases? Usually we have one of our GU pathologists that'll We'll read any type of frozen sections that uh, the person on frozen has challenges reading. So most of the time we don't need to specifically request a geopathologist. And so that works out pretty well. I will tell you for more advanced cases, sometimes when we need frozen section of angle notes, those are when I specifically request that one of my geopathologists looks at it just to make sure if I'm going to need to do more elaborate type of surgery of, of the lymph nodes, for example. I really want to make sure I get a good understanding of what's the likelihood that that patient may have metastatic nodes that are involved. Fair. Yeah. I mean, I certainly, you know, when it comes to testis cancer patients, a lot of times when you're messing around with frozens, it can be challenging as is. And again, you know, penile cancer is rare enough where I think we've all seen our fair shares of atypias and certainty, you know, we'll, we'll kind of get to that in a minute. You know, so it's hard to lump penile cancer patients into easily distinguishable buckets just because they're all, every patient is so unique with their underlying comorbidities and, you know, their disease characteristics. But let's just maybe start with like CIS, kind of erythematous patches on the glands. What are your kind of preferred management options for these kinds of folks? 
So I'm really glad you asked that because I get calls about this all the time. I've literally had colleagues calling me from the operating room trying to resect some of these and they keep getting positive margins. And they're like, what do we do about it? So, you know, it goes back to what you brought up, Adidia, early on is having a biopsy and understanding whether it's CIS before you go in to do a resection is helpful. But when it's CIS, I really adopted a, a pattern of trying topical chemotherapy first line. You know, I think the Europeans did, did some really nice work on in this area, and we've done some follow-up work in this area using Effudex and Imiquimod. It works really, really well. You know, response rates of anywhere from about 60 to 80%, most of the time within six weeks. So most of the time you can avoid a major resection. Problem with CIS, like we see for other areas of carcinoma site to you, is the field of disease can be pretty large. So, you know, sometimes if you're going to want to do a wide local excision, you may be doing a fairly large wide local excision and have to do a skin graft. So oftentimes if you can get away with topical chemo with toxicity, which is usually very, just very acute over a couple of weeks, I definitely think it's the way to go. And I just make sure that my team spends some time explaining how to apply these, these agents. It's amazing to see, you know, if you don't do that, some people start lathering these agents, which could be fairly irritative to the skin and cause a lot of blistering. So as long as you explain how to do it properly and you have your team, which will educate patients, it usually works out really well and it's well tolerated for that duration of about six weeks of treatment. You guys work with your Mohs surgery colleagues very much? We do a little bit. Uh, someone has asked me about that actually today. And I would tell you for small lesions, particular superficial lesions, I think it's a good option. I always get a little concerned when people start doing Mohs for lesions that are not really appropriate, you know, lesions that are larger, lesions that are more extensive, or lesions that involve the urethra. I've seen that a few times where you actually have intraurethral lesions and they've been doing Mohs on the glands, trying to get to the uh, urethral component of the lesion. So I think as long as it's done in the well-selected setting, small peripheral lesions, less than a centimeter or so, and understanding that if it doesn't respond, then really the urologist is the right place these patients should be evaluated. I think it works well. Yeah, I think that's a relationship that can be, you know, fairly synergistic. And then sometimes, unfortunately, it can be a little adversarial. We basically had a scenario in Dallas where if there was any dermatology, most surgeons involved, they would always be kind of co-managed with the urologist just to make sure you're doing the groin exams, assessing for appropriateness of the of the lesion and it was prostate cancer surgeons and radiation oncologists who kind of work together almost like a multidisciplinary clinic because clearly we're, we're just talking about biopsies and diagnoses but when we really kind of get into the thick of it you know there really are so many different permutations okay and you know for the sake of completeness any laser ablation that's going down in in Moffitt yeah you know we do it for some small peripheral lesions you know co2 laser we've used ND YAG as well I would say that for TA lesions, it's pretty good. T1s and TIS, we haven't had great experience with it. So we've moved away from it for the most part. So I think very selective for the laser patients. And I would say most of the time, if I'm going to consider doing laser, usually either we'll do a wide local excision or if patients very insisting they want to do a laser type ablation, avoid excision, we'll do it, but we'll follow the patients. And I think like anything, when you do a resection, if I do anything like even topical agents or I do laser, I have a low threshold for a biopsy to make sure I've had a good response. So it's always important to sort of say, if it's not quite healing well or what you expect, you know, get a biopsy, make sure that you, you've really eradicated the cancer and that you don't have a, a persistent or recurrent cancer there. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Absolutely. And you mentioned it earlier, you know, the, the urethral recurrences, those tumors that are right there on the glance and kind of in the fossa, I think that can be a, a nasty place for recurrences when you're not a little bit more definitive. And maybe this is a good time to talk about it, you know, just margins at the time of resections and, you know, it's going to apply. What are the kind of typical margins that you're sending? Yeah, so that's also an important point. And I like to emphasize, you know, we're training, I found like I'm old school now, we used to say a two centimeter margin, then a one centimeter margin, but now Really, anything more than a one millimeter margin, as long as you feel confident that you got a clean margin, I think that's sufficient. It's never wrong if you feel you're concerned to take a little bit more tissue and just make sure that it's truly negative. And, you know, you brought up a great point is when you do frozen sections, you do want to make sure that you have good expertise on the pathology side that they feel comfortable calling a margin positive or negative so that you can resect what you need to. But similarly, you're not resecting more than you should. And most of the time, I think you'll get a definitive answer in terms of that if you have a good team that are looking over these specimens. Agree. Yeah. I mean, obviously for the 
you know, more superficial, non panectomy, obviously get a negative margin. Then I'll kind of go back and forth between mapping biopsies that are sent from, you know, the stay side and then a deep margin as well. You know, once we get talking about partial panectomies and so forth, I'll generally send a urethral margin to kind of round that out. But those are the skin margins, the deep margin and the urethral margin are typically the ones that I've sent. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I will typically do that from the main specimen, from the partial, I'll send the corporal cavernosal bodies and then urethra uh, margins separately marking out and delineating specifically where I wanted mark. And usually they're pretty good at making sure and looking at those separately and distinctively. And, uh, if ever there, there isn't that, I always go and, and actually look at the specimens myself and, and really feel that I'm confident and, uh, with what they're calling. I will tell you over, over the years, I've had a few frozen section called negative and lo and behold, when you get your final specimen, they call positive and people ask me, what do you do with that? Depends what it is. If it's CIS. Sometimes you just observe it and just see what, what happens a couple of times. And I've talked to some counterparts in the United Kingdom, they'll treat with topical effudex, a positive margin. I've done that a few times and patients nervous, or if there's an area I'm concerned a little bit, it works actually really quite well. And it gives you that extra level of reassurance. But obviously if you have an invasive margin, I think then, then you have to consider more surgery. Yeah. And what about radiation in those patients? Yeah, definitely. I think that's the other option. And, you know, we've done that a few times when the patient really is not too keen on getting or undergoing additional surgery. I would say the only thing with that is got to obviously make sure they've healed appropriately. I like to get some level of imaging studies to see, you know, if there's an area, discrete area we could specifically treat. I think brachytherapy can have a role specifically in cases like that or external beam. But obviously, depending on how close you are to the urethra, you may have a concern with strictures and those types of things. But I definitely think there's a role for radiation in some, some cases for sure. Let's talk a little bit about imaging. Do you stage the primary with the uh, MRI or anything along those lines? You know, for a conventional non-invasive lesion, I typically will not unless the physical examination is questionable or I can't really feel the tumor at depth of invasion and those types of things. If it's a more invasive tumor and I'm sort of thinking I'm heading for a partial panectomy or I'm trying to determine if I can get away with something a little less invasive or truthfully, if it's a really tumor which looks like it's actually fairly deep and I, I might need to do a total panectomy and trying to figure out how deep it ultimately goes, then I'll typically will get additional imaging. I like MRI. If there's no contraindication, I think it gives you a very good resolution down in the pelvis. And obviously it'll allow you to assess the inguinal nodes as well to determine the status of those as well on, on the study. All right. So if you have a patient that's coming in, you know, T2, T3 tumor, let's just say a, a single node on one side, palpable, you're nervous about it. Are you generally going to manage these in the same setting or, or how do you approach them? So that's a great question. So I would say it all depends a little bit on what the primary is. So if the tumor is clearly a T2, T3 tumor, you're going to have to do the nodes anyway. So I would say probably as long as the primary is not one, I'm concerned about infection and the patient's obviously not incredibly sick. Then I would say addressing the nodes at the same time makes sense. I will tell you for a study we're doing right now, this impact trial that's taking place, if they do have palpable nodes, then unofficially we're supposed to ideally get a biopsy of the neural nodes to get a confirmatory diagnosis of the nodal status as pathologically positive. So then we would biopsy the nodes before. But I do like the concept of particular in patients with really low volume nodal metastases to do in the same setting. You just, you address everything in the same time. If it's bulkier, then obviously that's a different thought. Yeah. And um, I think you kind of touched on it that the character of the primary, you know, if it's an infected fungating one, I'm generally less inclined to do the nodes and the primary at the same time. I feel like, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this delicate tissue handling, maintaining the flaps, preserving the vasculature, you do everything, tissue sealants, drains, and, you know, every now and again, something still pops up with a seroma, something along those lines. So if, if their primary is infected, I will generally try to handle the primary, get them staged. And, you know, generally, I think a high quality chest CT and an MRI abdomen pelvis is my go-to. I think PET scans have some exciting opportunities, particularly advanced stage. But yeah, I guess bottom line, if it's an infected primary, I'll generally knock one out. Yeah, I think, and I think that's a good thought. I agree with you. And I, you know, I tell people too, when, when I'm doing a more radical resection, particularly like a total 
I emphasize this to my trainees all the time. Leaving a drain in is always a good thought when you start doing a total panectomy and a perineal arthroscopy. Oftentimes they will get some small seromas or hematomas and those can get infected. I remember having one a couple months ago and it was really challenging to sort of manage. And I used to tell people put a pen rose, but I, I've gone back to putting JPs. They just, they give you much more reliable drainage of those areas and, and doing a really good washout of those areas, particularly if they're infected and really being, like you said, meticulous with the tissues, debriding any, any tissue you're concerned about and just really make sure of the viability of, of all the specimens. Yeah. And you mentioned the impact trial. I think it's a great, great study. I'm kind of curious what the, you know, national uptake is for biopsying a low risk primary with the palpable node. I'd like to think the historical, rather dangerous practice of six weeks of antibiotics and reassessing is hopefully largely fallen out of favor. But uh, so solitary node, kind of a centimeter or so, impalpable, mobile, you feel pretty good attacking that upfront surgery? Yeah, I think so. And I think you're right. You know, your point you made is a good one is, and we asked this on a, a recent questionnaire to SUO members. We asked them specifically to your question is if you have a palpable node, you know, small, low volume, do you give the six weeks? Do you do a biopsy? Do you operate on them? It was nice to see that only about 25, 30% of urologists were still giving the six week course antibiotics. You probably wish it was less than that because I think you're just delaying ultimate treatment for those patients. And either you're going to biopsy them or you're going to manage them, depending on, again, on your primary tumor characteristics. So I definitely think that's, uh, that's something which is important to emphasize for all our trainees and also for urologists caring for those patients. And one thing I tell the residents is generally the palpable nodes are kind of almost like right there just above where the cord comes in. Is that your sense as well? That that's really where you kind of want to dial in. You feel the pulse of the artery, move me to a couple finger breaths and spend your time right there, just kind of off the tubercle, right where your cord's coming in. Yeah, you're right. You know, I think that's when, when we do those, those no dissections, I tell them that's the, obviously the whole template of dissection is critical, but that's where really the money is going to be is you really want to clean out that whole triangle from the inguinal ligament in that crease right along the cord and really make sure you've taken all those lymph nodes out because if you don't, that's where you're often going to be harboring. And that's, like you said, is that where the dynamic sentinel lymph node and, and where a lot of that work in, in melanoma, the cabanus node, as we like to call it, is, is sort of known to be uh, situated. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, early on, I was humbled. You do a node dissection, you see the shelving edge, you come down, you, you kind of clean out your boundary, and then you palpate right there. And you're like, oh my God, I think I just left the node of interest. And, you know, you go back and, and take it out. But yeah, that's one that I always kind of hammer home to the trainees. So bilateral nodes, fixed nodes, are you starting to think multimodal at this point? Yeah, I think it's important to sort of definitely start thinking about that. Obviously, you know, you brought up PET-CT. I think, you know, in addition to our standard imaging, axial imaging, CT or MR, I think PET is a very useful study, particularly in the bulky setting. You sometimes are picking up nodes you may not necessarily would have thought are suspicious. So I think it's good to get a baseline PET CT. And I would say that's when, whether or not we're putting a patient on a trial like that impact trial, we sort of get multimodal conversations and tumor board discussions. And I general will we'll have those patients see my medical oncologist and radiation oncologist, and we discuss all those cases on a per, per case basis. And we start thinking we're likely going to go multimodal and we start coordinating, okay, what chemo are they potentially going to be getting if we think they need to get it. I am an advocate of multimodal care in, in patients with advanced penile cancer. There are cases, no question, you know, if they have poor renal function, if the patient's very symptomatic from the nodes and you feel you can resect it all, where you may want to go up front and do the surgical resection. I still think, you know, I don't necessarily think neoadjuvant chemotherapy is as effective as ultimately we want it to be or should have it to be. At this point, you know, I think all those meta-analyses when we did and others, you know, 16% CR rate, 53% objective response rate. That's very far from an ideal state from what you'd expect from, from a systemic agent that's effective against a disease. Yeah. I mean, clearly it's something that's, I would say, controversial at different centers. People have their opinions on it and, you know, you, you really can't blame them. I mean, A, there's the data that B, you look at the NCCN guidelines and you've got nodes and you can do inguinal lymph dissection or chemotherapy. 
or chemo radiation or any combination. It's just, you know, when there's four options that are all in the guidelines, I think that is pretty obvious that we don't have any clear cut best case. And I do think the impact trial is, is a great one. It's definitely one of the first ones on my to-do list at San Diego to get on our docket and happy that it's actually going through our regulatory committee to, to open that one up because it's tough. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but I feel the same way. It, it does kind of boil down to case by case, expert opinion, um, without a lot of data. You know, we've done things with people, these nodes are about to fungate out SPRT to the nose to temporize them, to get them through chemo. Then you're going back and doing the groins and the pelvis and having a, a lack of clarity is, you know, it is what it is and it, it's a rare disease. But so patients coming in, primary in place, bilateral nodes. Um, you know, we certainly saw this with indigent population in, in Dallas and quite frankly, in San Diego as well. Just kind of one-on-one, are you typically okay trying to start these patients out on chemotherapy if they can tell it from a renal function standpoint or manage the primary or what's your, what's your algorithm here? So large nodes and uh, intact primary. Yeah. So that's a really, really, really good question. And, you know, you mentioned that it's on, on a case by case basis. If it's a really ugly primary tumor, I often like to manage that early on because I've seen it, you know, I, I advocate it, but I've seen it is sometimes my medical oncologist twist my arm. He's like, look, Phil, I want to get this patient on chemo. A little bit like the test. This is, you know, not so worried about the primary. And then lo and behold, we give him chemo and the primary starts becoming symptomatic and becomes purulent and delays care. And now, you know, chemo that was ideally going to be given over three to four months has been sort of been given over, over a few additional months and discontinued and obviously less effective. And now the disease is progressing and now I'm doing a salvage surgical resection. So if I can address the primary and get it out of the way, then I, I'd like to. Now, if it's a small primary and it's not a big deal, you know, the resection wouldn't be a big deal to do. But if we want to go the systemic route because we're concerned about it, then I think then that's reasonable to consider doing in that in that specific scenario. I definitely have seen some patients where we've given chemo in the setting of the primary place and the primary has, has had an unbelievable response, nearly quite like a T0 type response, but I don't advocate to patients that based on that, you should expect your tumor is going to go away by giving chemotherapy. So definitely something. No, it's an interesting thought though, almost like a marker lesion. I don't advocate at all with some of the kind of microRNA work we've done where patients had nasty disease, they get chemo and then you do an orchid, I mean, RPL and D and the orcs had a small amount of tumor and the RPL and D is negative. You know, we've all kind of seen these patients like, hmm, wouldn't it be interesting to consider almost like a stepwise approach? But I, I think it's, you're spot on, you know, are they diabetic? Are they obese? Are they like just like at a raging risk of having some kind of like massive sepsis complication? That's the patient you got to handle the primary. If it's some big 10, 12 centimeter tumor, like you just got to take that out of the equation and get on with it. Generally, would you say that you're kind of aggressive to pull off a partial penectomy or do you, you know, if it's kind of at the threshold or, or are you pretty aggressive with radicals and uh, perineal urethrostomies if it's really going to be a stretch either due to body habitus or remaining length? So, you know, I think the impact of a total penectomy on a man is devastating. And I would say so many examples we all have of doing that. And I would say I, I hate doing that operation for multiple reasons. It's mutilating. I don't feel like get personal satisfaction from having to do a total penectomy in a male and a perirethrostomy. So I leave that as my absolute last resort. If the tumor clearly is encompassing the entire penile shaft, you don't have a choice. I would say we probably underutilize partial penectomy with reconstructive techniques like a paniculectomy and other reconstructive type techniques we could do with our plastic surgical colleagues and sometimes even morbidly obese patients. And it's incredible just maintaining a functional PLS shaft in a male, the impact, the favorable impact it will have on quality of life and overall uh, feeling of maintaining masculinity and, and, and gender association. So, and depression, you know, obviously being significantly less and good studies associated with it. So I would tell you, I absolutely do it as my last resort. I definitely still do that operation, but I would say that is really when I really have exhausted other options I would consider for that patient. Yeah, I feel like I start off every radical penectomy with, this is my least favorite operation. And even the big partials, that's like a pretty close second. I mean, you, you maintain stuff. And I just, I guess I was reflecting that sometimes in an effort to like pull off a partial, you know, they've got kind of a buried penis meatus coming out of their penoscortal junction. And I'm really not quite sure how functional it is. And 
I've asked, you know, patients are typically fine with it, but I've kind of asked myself, like, did I really do the best operation? Should I just have been a little bit more definitive, particularly with the um, management of the urine? But yeah, it's uh, hats off to you to kind of making a career after this because uh, it's grisly business oftentimes. Chemo radiation, how does that generally kind of play in? Is that going to be an option for platinum in an eligible patients or adjuvant? Um, how do you generally typically employ that? Yeah, so we definitely have a great group here in radiation oncology or her part of our multi-D care. And I would say, no question, I think for the most part, these tumors are radio resistant. We have some data from our institution. The group here has done some work uh, looking at radiation sensitivity, indices looking at genomic markers of radiation response. And they've shown actually quite nicely in some retrospective work that they published that we probably underdose a lot of radiation to the to peanut cancer. It's probably more resistant to radiation than we thought, but it does respond when you typically give those higher dose of like close to 60, 62 gray. So, you know, we do definitely have seen that probably in certain patients, it probably has a more beneficial effect than in most. I would say that sometimes if it's really a, a really nasty tumor and uh, up front, particularly if we feel like the nose and the pelvis and the pr particular if there's more extensive disease in the retroperitoneum and we really are trying to get some level of local control, we'll add radiation to the chemotherapy up front. I will say that we have some, I would say, fairly early data that HPV positive tumors probably have more of a radiation response than HPV negative tumors. So it comes in the equations to some extent based on some, I would say, early data. And I would say that no question, I think if we have recurrences, we have uh, local regional recurrences, we have used radiation. We do have data that if it's a recurrence in the inguinal area, surgery still remains your best option if they have somewhat of a good response to systemic agents before. But I think sometimes getting some control with radiation does work. And I've definitely seen over the years, some patients were really able to, to get local regional control for a period of time. Understanding sometimes, especially in the advanced setting, you know, I think you have to look at it as palliative and symptom management, not necessarily always curative. I'd say that's very few and far between. Yeah, fair. And, you know, surgery, like, have always kind of thought that this is largely a surgical disease and have also been humbled with multimodal treatment. You go in, you do both groins. So what I would typically do is do the both groins open then do the pelvis robotically, say they had some suspicious nodes early on or if they're, you know, clinical and three out of the get go. And you just kind of know that the pelvis is going to have to be managed. You do these big operations and, um, you know, literally six weeks later, they're popping up with like in transit metastases in, in the mons and other areas. I haven't said that it's dissuaded me that the backbone is surgery, but it's certainly tempered my counseling a little bit, perhaps. You ever had any experiences like that? Yeah, absolutely. It's like that ominous sign. And I know you've probably seen this as you operate on a patient, you feel pretty good. You did a good resection. They come in and lo and behold, you're seeing these little cutaneous things popping up in the inguinal perineal area. And you're like, oh, I know what that is. And lo and behold, you do a biopsy and it is, it's, it's a cutaneous metastasis from squamous cell carcinoma. And, you know, you didn't have any contamination or surgical field. It's just the biology of these tumors. And just the, the SUO, one of my colleagues, our colleagues from uh, New York was telling me about a case like that where he did the groin and literally six weeks later, he had a tumor that was twice as big as what he resected. And he's like, did I do anything wrong? I said, no, I think that's just the biology that patient had. And I don't think there's anything you could have done different. I think, unfortunately, you're start a, sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And you could sort of say, well, I would have given systemics and I would argue, well, he probably would have grown through systemics, understanding the biology and how effective these systemic agents are. So in that setting, I just think we need better systemic agents for many of these tumors. Well, and I think it's wonderful. I mean, the work that you've done with Andrea Necky on trying to do some of the genomic characterization with Foundation One, you know, always, always hats off to Andrea Apollo for having a clinical trial for these folks. On the, We've definitely sent people there not infrequently when you're kind of running out of options. Generally, we'll try to get them sequenced um, in-house, you know, whether that's Tempest or Foundation, Keras, whatever your platform du jour is to see if there's anything targetable and, and shepherd them towards a clinical trial if pertinent. I mean, by all means, you know, I think the bulk of this is you've got to see enough of it to to have some comfortability with it. Phoning a friend is is 
always a good idea. I think your friends at your home institution in a multi-D format is almost mandatory. And, um, you know, it'd be great to see outcomes in, in a place such as yours that has like a penile cancer tumor board versus ones where, where things are kind of coming off the fly. And, you know, as we get into more advanced stage disease, post-radiation, big resections, flaps, plastic surgery, you know, the whole nine yards, that kind of gets to maybe one end of the bell curve. But maybe let's just talk a little bit about surgical technique and perioperative management specifically for inguinal lymph node dissections. I mean, I personally believe that this would be urologic oncologists doing these, uh, doing these operations. I mean, they're tricky enough. I don't know many centers in the country that are doing dynamic sensual lymph node biopsies. And if you're seeing four to six cases of penile cancer a year, you're probably in the top 5%, I'm guessing. Um, but yeah, so when you're, when you're doing these cases, setting them up, what are, what's your kind of your, your things that you're running through with, with your clinic staff, with the residents, with the fellows to try to get them through without any complications? So great question. Um, so, you know, whether you do this robotically, whether you do this open or single port, you know, in some places, I think, I think you have to obviously be very respectful of your boundaries of dissection. Like anything we do surgically, your best chance of cure is the first time around. If you feel you do the surgery better open or you feel more comfortable open, offer them open surgery to do the groins. Or same thing for robotics. I think I think you have to adhere. You have to make sure, like you said, you're following the templates. You're getting all those nodes, including the ones in the supermedial component. I think when I do the operation, I think very meticulous in, in handling of the tissues. Preoperatively, we always make sure we optimize those patients. Make sure if they're malnourished or if there's any you know diabetes or poorly controlled sugars, we optimize those before surgery. Standard, obviously, antibiotics, etc. But the actual surgery itself, you know, making sure you get in the appropriate planes, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you maintain uh, thick skin flaps. But at the same time, like you said, it can be a little tricky, especially when you're doing these surgeries to leave some nodes. So get right on the inguinal ligament, you know, follow your adductor longus sartorius flaps. You know, if you're doing a superficial, if you don't have palpable disease, there's really no reason to take the saphenous vein if you don't need to or to get you know, and to do a deep no dissection uh, beyond the fascia lata. So I, I would say that it's really uh, critical that you really do uh, a surgery meticulously, control lymphatics, major lymphatics. I think if you are using any form of energy device, I like the ligature, but I have no affiliations with the ligature company or anything. I just think it does probably a better job on sealing lymphatics than a harmonic scalpel. And uh, obviously leaving drains. It's interesting, uh, on the drain part, talking to some colleagues in, in Europe, they don't leave drains, for example, in some countries. They literally bring the patients back in clinic and aspirate these collections every two, three days. Uh, I think we practice in a different healthcare system. It'd probably be impossible to do that in my institution, probably yours as well. Adidia. So I would say I usually leave the drains until there's minimal drainage. People ask me, what's minimal? I say if it's less than 30 every eight hours for a couple of shifts, then I leave the drains in. And I teach my residents and my, my APP this, staples stay in until things are completely healed. This is not one of those 10 days take out staples. When they open up, it's a big deal. So I'd rather have a little bit of train tracks forming and, and make sure there's no tension and nothing opens up, particularly in, in patients where there's a little bit of tension in those areas. What about compression stockings? Yeah, I do those. I, I use those. I counsel them about it. We get occupational therapy to see the patients up front and try to ensure they're educated and familiar. And from the perioperative period until uh, several weeks afterwards, we continue using those and make sure they're fitted and reassessing for lymphedema. Like you said, uh, you know, saphenous vein sparing, meticulous lymphatic control, I think those make really big differences. And I think also, if you can confine your surgical dissection to a superficial in the which, and all your nodes are negative, there's really no reasons to do a deep. I think you get into some major lymphatic issues when you start having to really take all the lymphatic drainage or most of the drainage to the lower extremities in a given case. So once you do deeps or do pelvics, I think that's when we start seeing the more moderate to severe lymphedema in those patients. Yeah, that's totally a voodoo. I'll usually also put some aerosolized sealant in at the end to kind of glue the space shut, recognizing that this is totally just telling me sleep better at night and probably not a lot of data behind it. Incisional wound vacs? Ooh, good one. Um, I don't typically use them. I will say no question in my straightforward case where, you know, I haven't given preoperative radiation or chemotherapy where I'm not concerned. 
I definitely don't think it makes necessarily a difference. You know, there is that study from Germany, which was a negative study in terms of looking at wound healing. I will say there's no question. There are some patients, especially the ones that got pre-out of radiation, the patients who are really are diabetics, poorly controlled and others where I think there may be value. I definitely think there is an opportunity to look at this in a prospective clinical trial purpose in that specific set of patients that are higher risk wounds where it potentially could make a difference. But we haven't used uh, much of these in, in recent months. And uh, I know some of my colleagues told me they've, they've really had wonderful experiences with it, but we haven't really used them here. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? And we can try to be cost conscious all at the same time. Well, Phil, this is great. You know, I think this is hopefully the type of information that, you know, really transcends where you are in your in your urology career and, and maybe even for our colleagues in primary care as well, that here's at least some general concepts. I've certainly learned a lot over the course of the last 45 minutes or so. Any parting thoughts, you know, as it pertains to penile cancer for people that encounter this disease? I definitely think there's a lot of opportunity for education, for patient advocacy. Uh, you know, we started an organization about a year and a half ago which is not financially based to promote education and advocacy for patients, the Global Society of Rare GU Tumors. And there's some really great groups uh, for clinicians out there that are looking for resources. There's this organization called ORCID, or one started by patients in the United Kingdom called Check Your Tackle that works with us through the Global Society. But I think it's important that we give the tools. And uh, I tell people all the time, it's probably useful and practical, and I do spend a lot of time educating my patients, but sometimes talking to patients who've actually lived it firsthand is much more empowering and impactful than, than hearing it from me. So I think you know, using those resources and offering it to our patients is critical as well. I think it's an absolutely excellent point. You know, I, I literally saw a guy this past week, large primary, kind of been through the salves and the antibiotics, and he ultimately had an abscess. He's got a nasty tumor, bilateral palpable mobile nodes. I'm curious to see what you, I mean, they're about a centimeter right in the primary landing zone. I'm really tempted to, you know, I'm getting him staged, but I'm really tempted to start out with bilateral groins. I feel like he's a surgically curable guy. But we started talking about management of the primary and, you know, here's this 65 year old farmer rancher just kind of breaking down. And, and I do think that just kind of preemptively telling patients that this is hard, none of this is fun, getting them set up with cancer center support services, even better support group is massive because... I think wrapping your brain around it as a biological male is just a lot. It really is. Um, I, yeah, I have to. I got to pick your brain. So bilateral, mobile, maybe centimeter, centimeter, some change nodes, large primary intact. I'm inclined to handle the primary because it's pretty infected and and nasty, and it was I and D as a part of the biopsy. Then come back and as long as nothing's going gangbusters, surgically start out with the nodes. Unless we have the impact trial open by then, then you know clearly a trial patient. Yeah, that would, that would be a great patient for the study, no question. But I think I think that's a good thought process in terms of planning for him. And like you said, you know, he'll be healed from his primary uh, management probably pretty quick, and you could address the nose pretty shortly afterwards, and you won't have to worry about that. Thanks for validating me, Phil. I'm not above a phone and a friend. Thanks for allowing me to be part of this. 